Good evening, I'm Jose Cardenas. We'll talk about the passing of Justice Antonin Scalia and what's next for the U.S. Supreme Court. And is it just a word? A discussion about the controversy that surrounded it, the N-word at Desert Vista High School. Plus, an event to celebrate entrepreneurs in Arizona. We'll talk to a film director about how he started in the filmmaking business. All this coming up on Horizonte. Horizonte is made possible by contributions from the friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. The death of Justice Antonin Scalia not only complicates the upcoming Supreme Court term, but it also impacts the political landscape. Joining us now to help us understand what is next is ASU Law Professor Eric Luna. Professor Luna, welcome to Horizonte. Thank you for having me, Jose. Uh, you know, it, it, it is almost uh, sad that uh, we spent so little time talking about his impact on the court, regardless of, of what you, uh, your political persuasion, and immediately started bickering about uh, how we're going to pick a replacement. Right. It's unfortunate because his legacy is, a, is truly a great one, whatever political persuasion you may have. Certainly, um, he was often associated in his decisions with uh, positions that would be deemed conservative politically. Um, but he, uh, on more than one occasion, surprised folks given his particular interpretation of the Constitution, his methodology for statutory interpretation. Um, his loss will be significant for the court and for the legal profession. And one of those areas of surprise, I, I take it, would be First Amendment decisions where, where he took what some would regard as, as a liberal position. Absolutely. He, he, uh, one, one particular case that he's well known for and would like to point out when people started to discuss how politically oriented the court had become is that he voted with the majority in striking down a flag burning uh, statute. Um, and it was, he, he did not want to do that. He said publicly that that was against uh, his feelings about those individuals who would actually go about burning a flag. And yet he knew that the First Amendment pushed him to that conclusion. And as I recall, Justice Stevens, one of the liberals, was on the other side of that. I think that's right. Yeah. So um, uh, it, the fact is that it has devolved into a, a, a lot of discussion about replacing him. Um, and I guess a couple of the ironies are uh, the political polarization that we see he manifested some of that in his opinions, particularly earlier in his career, where he would write some stinging dissents that included a lot of personal insults about his colleagues. Sure. He, he certainly was not um, uh, above using, uh, let's say, colorful language. And um, uh, there is some, some thought on the, uh, among those who are court watchers that uh, his relationship with Justice O'Connor may have soured because of, of, of some of those stinging dissents. Um, but that's also where, to, to some, to those who followed um, uh, Justice Scalia, and to some extent he was almost like a rock star among conservative uh, legal uh, scholars and attorneys, um, that was what made Scalia Scalia. Um, uh, those who obviously didn't, didn't, uh, didn't agree with him on those positions uh, saw it in a, a far different light. But also some speculation that perhaps because of, of uh, his style, uh, it cost him the opportunity to become Chief Justice. I think that, that's, that's one very good point, as well as, unlike some of his predecessors, he was not a coalition builder. Um, he would state what his position was uh, through his particular lens. He was, as, as the media has pointed out, he was an originalist. And in, indeed, he was the original originalist in terms of Supreme Court uh, interpretation. Uh, and so he was not willing, in, at least until later on in his career, uh, to uh, compromise on positions, and that probably left him more often uh, than he would like in concurrences and dissents. And uh, speaking about the topic of, original, of, the, of the originalist uh, position, um, some have pointed out that on this current debate between Republicans and Democrats, he probably would be siding with President Obama about whether the Constitution permits or doesn't permit him to name a successor. I, I think it's right. I think he would look at the text and the background. The president has the right to uh, to make the nomination, and of course, the uh, the Senate has the right to uh, to give or withhold their consent. Um, uh, the court, the, both Justice Scalia and the court, undoubtedly would stay out of this if it, if it ever became a controversy. And try, and trying to fill Justice Scalia's uh, very large shoes. Um, it's, it is a political controversy and probably not a legal one. So I want to talk a little bit about the politics of it, but before we get that, the impact on the court um, of uh, not appointing somebody, somebody's not going to be appointed in time to, to participate in some of the oral arguments that are coming up, no matter what. Right. Um, but uh, a, a court that's split fairly evenly, what's going to happen with some of the uh, 
important cases that are scheduled for argument. Well, all those cases that you might have foreseen as being 5-4 with Justice Scalia and the majority, those uh, almost as a matter of force are going to be 4-4 decisions, uh, or they will be scheduled for re-argument um, in uh, the next term. Uh, either way, it's likely to change the, the landscape for some pretty important issues that are uh, before the Supreme Court, whether it's affirmative action, whether it's abortion, whether it's redistricting, whether it is uh, President Obama's executive action with regards to immigration. All of those issues uh, could, could have been um, uh, tightly divided cases and decisions where a Justice Scalia in the majority um, uh, would have tipped it in favor of one position rather than the other. Uh, those may end up, uh, again, 4-4 which would lead to affirming the lower court decision, whatever it was, uh, or the Supreme Court simply punting it down the road. So a 4-4 vote is, is uh, perhaps just a temporary victory for whoever won in the court below, right? Because it can still come back up and, and a full court could decide it differently. The Supreme Court has a, an incredibly tenacious ability to, to take cases when they want to hear them. So even if they were to decide that this case should be, this is a 4-4 decision, reaffirming whatever the lower court decision, they could take it at a later point. They always in, have that authority. In any sense as to whether they're more likely on, on the more pressing cases, for example, the immigration one that, that is now before them um, on, on the president's use of executive action. Um, any sense for whether they'll go the 4-4 route or, or just reschedule for oral argument? Boy, that's, uh, that would be reading the tea leaves, and I don't know what the answer is. I think it really will come down to, is there some room with the eight remaining justices to come to some uh, conclusions with regards to those otherwise uh, uh, highly divided cases. If not, it may well get punted down the road, or in the case of, um, of the, uh, the president's immigration decision, um, uh, we'll just simply keep the status quo as it is now. So let's talk quickly uh, in the time we have left about the process of, of uh, nominating a successor. The president says he's going to do that. Right. Uh, Republicans initially said, uh, no way, we're not going to even consider any, any nominees. They seem to be backing off a little bit. Senator Grassley has said, He'll wait until he sees who the president nominates to decide whether he's going to allow a hearing. Right. I, I suspect there's probably been some back-channeling between the White House and the key senators, uh, those who are on the Judiciary Committee or have a particularly important uh, voice in these types of issues, about the notion of presenting something of a moderate type uh, uh, a candidate, someone who would, uh, could placate both the left and the right, at least in the short term. Um, undoubtedly, they'll be looking to, to several judges that are currently on what is essentially the AAA team for the Supreme Court, the D.C. Circuit. Um, and some of them could be some groundbreaking um, potential candidates. Uh, Sri Srinivasan would be the first um, uh, Indian American to be, uh, to be on the Supreme Court. Um, uh, and he received a, uh, he was confirmed unanimously, I believe in a 97-0 vote. Um, there'll be other candidates as well that will be discussed. And then uh, almost like an unexpected Christmas, we'll hear uh, the decision undoubtedly in a couple of weeks. So um, I saw a, a, a posting on, on the Huffington Post, a blog, somebody suggesting that our own Diane Humitiwa, who was uh, confirmed as a district court judge about a year or so ago, um, would be perhaps the, the ideal choice for Obama, or at least would really test the Republican resolve not to allow Obama to make an appointment. What do you think of that? That should be a strong candidate and, and would be uh, formidable. Even both, though she's a Republican. Even though, as a Republican, she would be, potentially she would be someone who could bridge that gap in this uh, kind of precarious uh, nomination situation. Um, she's a district court judge. That we don't, uh, in recent memory, uh, we haven't had a district court judge that's nominated all the way to, up to the Supreme Court. But um, she would be a unique candidate, inc uh, incredibly well qualified, and would be a first, the first Native American uh, member of the Supreme Court. So um, uh, there, uh, all bets are, are, are possibilities in this, in, this, in this round. Well, there's a lot to look forward to. We'll see what develops. Thank you so much for joining us on Audio Sante to talk about it. Thank you, Jose. To find out more information about what's on Horizonte, go to azpbs.org and click on the Horizonte tab at the top of the screen. There you can access many features to become a more informed Horizonte viewer. Watch interviews by clicking on the video button or by scrolling down to the bottom of the page for the most recent segments. Learn about more specific topics like arts and culture and immigration. You can also find out what's on Horizonte for the upcoming week. If you would like an RSS feed, a podcast, or you want to buy a video, that's all on our website, too. Other features include our collection of website links and a special page for educators. While you're there, show your support for Horizonte with just one click. Discover all that's on Horizonte. Visit azpbs.org, Horizonte, today. 
when you want to be more connected. Friend us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Watch us online. The photo of six Desert Vista High School students wearing t-shirts depicting the N-word sparked conversation in the Valley and around the world about issues of racial sensitivity. Is it really just a word? Joining me to talk about this is Dr. Neil Lester, an ASU Foundation Professor of English and Founding Director of Project Humanities at ASU. Dr. Lester, thanks for joining us on Horizonte. You've been Thank here you. before. We've talked about this we before. We have talked about this uh, before. And, and early on after this all developed, you sent me an email saying, why are we still talking about this? Yes, and that's a bit of a rhetorical question, but it's also a question that I'm still pondering uh, because it seems like we're going in a circle and not exactly advancing in this conversation. I do hope that this moment, however, is different than the others. Uh, and, and, and what makes you hope that? I mean, is that a realistic hope? Well, I think it's, it's, it's now crossing into the generations, I think, that matter. And so, in many ways, I look at this as an opportunity since I have been uh, reached out to uh, as someone to advise uh, as they get through this circumstance uh, that, that not only will I be continuing my efforts to educate, but also having uh, the high school students along with me, I think could be a good team so that it's not just the, 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 the generational thing and the divide that seems to sort of dominate these conversations. Well, well let me ask you this. Um, uh, you've been working on this for some time. Uh, uh, the, the issue comes up repeatedly, um, uh, and 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 yet, uh, uh, and and the timing on this one in particular was was uh, unfortunate. Not that there's ever a good right. time, but it was what right on the heels of Martin Luther Absolutely. King. Absolutely, in the same week, actually. And I think that, in part, explains why this became a national, even international, story because um, Arizona is still living under that umbrella of the uh, MLK holiday and the approval not until 18, uh, 1986. And so this notion that, oh, yet another story about Arizona is something that we are still trying to uh, counter. But I think the fact that this happened at a school and that it happened among students who initially were not offended by this until they recognized that they should be at least concerned about this relative to language and, and hip hop and race relations and a kind of unawareness that was prevalent not only among those six young women, but also their fellow students of color. So while they knew that something was not quite right with the spelling of this, because of that delusional sense that you know, if you spell it you know, one way with a G-A or a G-A-H, then it doesn't mean the same thing as with the E-R. So I, I hope that this is an opportunity that we might get to the bottom of those kinds of uh, unfounded uh, conclusions that many young people still hold on to when they start talking about language and they start thinking about what they are hearing and absorbing around them. So uh, you indicated you've been contacted to, have, to be I part have. of the solution, so to speak, both locally and, and, and in other places. Correct. Well, and, and, and this is not the first time, but what it does solidify, however, is an immediate need that this is not just here in Arizona, but a school in uh, Oregon has reached out, as well as a school in Omaha, Nebraska. And this is uh, just on the heels of what happened in, in Ahwatukee, uh, in the sense that they don't want this to happen at their schools. So they're trying to be proactive, and part of that is listening to how students really think and what they really think about language, about race relations, and how what they think may differ from their parents' and grandparents' perceptions of race relations in America. And you and I talked a little bit off camera uh, about the fact that the involvement of the students may make this opportunity a little different than, than other situations. I, I think so, and, and I think because this is not a matter of singling those students out as representative of all students, but it also uh, sheds light on the fact that there needs to be more uh, cultural sensitivity and cultural um, awareness in the pedagogy, what goes on in the classrooms, and that's something that I've learned in this circumstance that I didn't necessarily know before this happened is that there's not consistent training uh, for teachers and staff uh, pedagogically as well as sort of generally when students are in schools that are not racially diverse and then those that are, are that are. So there's not a whole lot of, of pedagogical um, guidance in terms of how do you teach a text that has this word in it in such a way that the word doesn't overwhelm the text. 
whether it be To Kill a Mockingbird or Huckleberry Finn. So I think that's what's different about this conversation and the fact that this school could potentially be a model of what other schools across the nation might look like if they were to engage in making this a teachable moment. So new strategies may come out of this? New strategies will definitely come out of this. And, 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 and how would you build on that? Well, what I, what I, what I want to make sure that we do is to have um, ways that the students are communicating to each other. I have written. So it's not just you it's talking not just to me. them. I have, not, I have not, not that you aren't very persuasive on the <laughs> right. subject, but well, but I can't be everywhere, yeah. and I and I think that that I can communicate to certain parts of the audience. But I think that uh, the combination of of me and others with them will make a much stronger case as to why we need to be concerned about language, not so much about what people can and can't say because as I pointed out in, in many conversations with others, that this is not criminal unless it's attached to some behavior that is criminal. But the fact that there will be social consequences, I think uh, has to be expanded beyond my generation and this word, but rather what it means to post something on social media and have that never go away. So there are lots of ways that this can become a much larger conversation and a good teachable moment for all involved. Well, I'm hopeful that we'll have you back on the show to talk about what's been learned as opposed to another why is this still a problem Most question. Definitely. Thank you so much for joining us Thank on you. Horizonte. Thank you. Phoenix Startup Week is a week-long valley-wide celebration of Arizona's entrepreneur community. This year, the event is expected to attract Arizona investors, entrepreneurs, and aspiring entrepreneurs. We'll talk to a film director about this event and a new wave of entrepreneurial movie making. But first, here's a look at a clip of the making of the film, There and Back. Such an emotional attachment to the movie because of our real life experiences that we had while on set. It has a fantastic story. It has like this big journey that everybody takes, but it also takes time to focus on each character individually and to show how they're changing, how they've become different people. And I think that's really cool and really unique. It was difficult to prepare for, to say the least. Because of the way it's written, it's so fast paced and it's, it's very clever. Every new location we went to brought up a different challenge. First day was really scary. black bug bit a big brown bear and the big brown bear bled blue black blood everything else is nuts but that part is going good <laughs> <laughs> and the camera is great <laughs> the director producer's job entails among other things loading cast and crew suitcases cast in this case crew in this case Joining me now to talk about the film and Phoenix Startup Week are Marcus De Leon, filmmaker, producer, and director of There and Back, and Liana Vatoy, lead actress in the film. Thank you both for joining us on Horizonte. I, I, I want to talk about the process of getting the film made. Uh, I want to talk about Phoenix Startup Week because that was the financing. But, but uh, uh, Marcus, tell us about the movie itself and what the story, the plot line is. It's a family road trip drama, a brother, sister, and another sister who have a lot of past conflicts between them come together for their grandfather's funeral. One of them discovers that there is a family heirloom made by the grandfather who was a sculptor is missing. They take off after much fighting and arguing on a quick, what they think is gonna be a quick two hour round trip to Phoenix and back from Tucson. And when they get to Phoenix, carefree, discover the sculpture is not where they thought it was. They fight some more and embark on a four day road trip they never saw coming, did not expect, were not prepared for. So, Leanna, in the clip we showed, uh, you, you're saying uh, the first day it's pretty scary. You weren't talking yeah. about the movie. You were talking about the experience, I take it. Yeah. The, yeah. But, um, but tell, us, tell us about your perception of the story itself and what appealed to you about it. So, initially, uh, Marcus kept it really secret, the script. 
Um, he said it was a story about Arizona, and all I saw was this one character, and her name was Sybil, and she is brooding and emotionally complex, and the typical, uh, the typical woman that you want to see in movies, the independent go-getter, but also so vulnerable. Um, that's all I saw from the script early on. Um, and I wanted to be a part of it right away, of course. Um, and then I found out that the story was about Arizona, a place where I grew up, and um, little did I know that I would discover parts of Arizona that I never thought I would. So it was and, fascinating. And, and Marcus, it really is about Arizona, and you, it, I mean, Arizona runs throughout this movie. You, you, Arizona scenery, Arizona actors. Uh, you've been back and forth between Arizona and L.A. Why that focus on Arizona? Arizona is my second home state. I spent so much time there as a kid growing up. We were always going back and forth between California and Arizona. I resolved at some point in 2011, let's make a real movie with all this Arizona talent that we have here on both sides of the camera. To do that, I knew I would have to get 100% funding from Arizona. Hollywood would never fund a movie with this kind of completely inexperienced cast and crew. No one of the 50-something people involved in the movie had ever done a feature film before. To get that Arizona funding, I heard two and a half years of, no, get out of my office, no way, you'll never get this movie funded here. And then I got involved with the, I was invited to pitch the Tucson Desert Angels in a Shark Tank type environment. And we got one person, Robert Hungate of the Desert Angels, interested. Executive producer Timothy Kalkoff came on after that. And between myself, Bob, and Tim, we basically survived nine months of the financing process and finally got the money together, went into production four days later, and didn't stop for two and a half months. And am I right? Uh, my recollection from one of the articles about, about this process was the story itself was inspired by, by seeing a, a young woman walking down an Arizona highway. I love the desert, both Mo Mojave Desert, Sonoran Desert. I love um, dilapidated towns, forgotten towns in the middle of nowhere. And the idea originally was a young woman walking down this highway. She's got a backpack and she's seeking. What is she seeking for? Why is she out there where no one walks? Why is she out there by herself? All those questions, and who's looking for her, if anyone, all those questions led to the creation of the whole three-act story. Now, Leanna, you've done other, other work in, in, in the film industry, but this one was different. How so? So I graduated from the ASU theater program, so I was given uh, the opportunity to work on multiple film projects there, uh, but this was something of a different magnitude. We were on the road for three months, um, and it was just on a whole other level. Um, it, it was the experience of a lifetime, really, an adventure. And, and, and Marcus, why is that different? I mean, you, you mentioned it, Leanna was just talking about it. Um, going from, from uh, short film projects uh, of, of a few days to, to something that goes on for several weeks. I interviewed and rehearsed and auditioned over and over. We did screen tests with, with the cast, the crew. I talked to them over and over and I said, do you guys really understand what we're gonna do here? We're going to hit the road for about two months or more and we're gonna be filming day after day after day for eight or 10 weeks. Do you have the rigor, do you have the commitment to a career as an actor or as a crew member, as a craftsman, as an artist to survive that kind of process? I look for people who had a commitment to becoming a filmmaker, cinematographer, actor. So Leanna, you hear that speech from, mm -hmm. from Marcus and, and, and you're probably thinking, yeah, I can do this. But, <laughs> but once you got into it, were there any challenges? Yeah, um, I would say there were a lot of challenges on, along the way. I remember my first day on set, I was really nervous because it was something, I mean, there were like 12 different crew members just staring at you and you're behind this camera um, and you know, you're expected to put on the best performance of your life. And uh, it was nerve wracking, but, but as we connected with everyone and got to know everyone, we realized that, that really it was, uh, you're working with people that are like-minded, that are all, that all have a driving, passion for filmmaking. So yeah, there were tons of challenges along the way for me personally also, but. Uh, it was a growth experience. Oh yeah, completely, yeah. Marcus, we're almost out of time. You're gonna be telling this story at Phoenix Startup Week. Uh, I, I think you're scheduled to speak on the 25th, but it, it goes on for several days. Um, uh, what's the lesson learned and what are you gonna be telling those people? Phoenix Startup Week being a five-day festival of entrepreneurship and startups, this movie was funded 
really as an entrepreneur, as a startup, I had to basically become an entrepreneur filmmaker. Didn't even know the term until after we finished production, read an article uh, in the New York Times about this new trend of entrepreneurial filmmakers, meaning the filmmaker interacts directly with his or her investors. There's no producer and no studio executives in between. And then the filmmaker, once the money's secured, if the filmmaker is that lucky, goes into production as a creative person. So the filmmaker is both business and creative to achieve a vision. And the way that this movie was funded and are, are being able to make it all in Arizona, I had creative freedom I would never get in Los Angeles. And, and, and we're, we're, we're pretty much out of time, but when will we see the movie? We'll see the movie this fall. Fall of 2016, there and back, we'll be in a film festival somewhere, and then we'll have a Phoenix premiere, a lot of fun. Well, best of luck to both of you, and thank you for joining us on Audio Sunday to talk about it. Uh, and that is our show for tonight. Thank you for watching from all of us here at Channel 8. I'm Jose Cardenas. Enjoy your evening. Horizonte is made possible by contributions from the friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you.